Okay, now last week I presented to you, I got to get my clicker. There we go. Now I'm ready. All right, I presented to you my understanding that in John chapter 4, verses 19 to 24, that Jesus taught there that, that his work marks a shift in the kind of worship God accepts. He was instituting a change in the way God is worshipped. Specifically, he taught that in the New Covenant, the Father is to be worshipped in a way that's more commensurate with the fact he is spirit, a non-physical entity. This means that his worship would no longer be tied to the existence of a physical holy site, whether a temple on Mount Gerizim or the temple in Jerusalem. Rather, the Father is to be worshipped by Christians, by participants in the New Covenant, in whatever city, town, or village they're located. Their assembly is a spiritual temple. Now, this new way of worship that better conforms to the truth God is spirit, it's called worship in spirit and truth. And the fact it's no longer tied to a physical holy site that implies the abrogation or the cancellation of the sacrificial system of worship that was integrally connected to the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, worship in spirit and truth is not only inconsistent with worship that's geographically restricted to a sacred site, it's also inconsistent with the sacrificial system of worship that was bound up with the Jerusalem temple. The writer of Hebrews makes it absolutely clear that that's the effect of Christ's work. And the early Christian writers, they recognized that the rejection of the Jewish sacrificial system, that that was implicit in what Jesus was teaching in John chapter 4. So even though it was specifically commanded by God, you see, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, the localized worship, of the Jerusalem temple was not the divine ideal, but it was an accommodation to the spiritual immaturity or the physical or sensual orientation of the Jews of that time. That was not worship in spirit and truth. That was not the worship God ultimately desired, but was a temporary manner of worship. Now, when we ended... I was explaining that instrumental music was a divinely prescribed part of temple worship, and it was closely associated with the offering of sacrifices. It was an inherent part of the system of sacrificial worship that was conducted in the temple. The system of worship that was done away with by Christ's work. And that explains why the church didn't use musical instruments from the very beginning. That's why they didn't do it. They would no more do that than sacrifice animals or burn incense to God. And last week I referred, well, this is what we looked at in John 4. And then last week I referred to various texts in First and Second Chronicles linking instrumental music to the ark, to the temple, and to the sacrifices and showing that musical instruments were a divinely prescribed part of the Levites' ministry in the temple. The use of instruments in temple worship, this was from God, not from David. This was divinely prescribed. Now, right when the second bell so rudely interrupted me, I was pointing out that Hezekiah, Hezekiah, when he restored temple worship, after King Ahaz's idolatry, Scripture says in 2 Chronicles, 25, verse 20, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25, it says, He stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. Again, you see, it's clear that musical instruments were a divinely prescribed part of Levitical ministry. They were an inherent part of the Jewish cult. The religious ritual practices of worship that were part of Judaism. 
They were a divinely prescribed part of that. Now, in 2 Chronicles 29, 26 to 28, that emphasizes the connection of instruments with sacrifices by showing that the musical accompaniment, it began with the burnt offering and it ended when the sacrifice was finished. It says the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord began also, and the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the singer sang, and the trumpeter sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So you see, right during the offering of the sacrifice... This is when it begins, then it ends. And so you see this connection. In Ezra chapter 3 verse 10, it makes clear that after the exile, when the Jews returned from exile, this is, this is more than 400 years after David's death, the Spirit-inspired instructions that David had given regarding worship, they were still followed. For they, they returned from exile and they're still following those spirit-inspired instructions. Musical instruments were used to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. So I want you to see that now. The, this connection between musical instruments and the sacrificial worship of the temple, it remained in later Jewish practice down into the first century. James McKinnon, who the, was the internationally respected historian of, of music and liturgy, McKinnon says that in the first century, as the sacrificial lamb was consumed on the altar fire and the libation of wine was being poured out, the priest would give several blasts on the trumpets, the cymbals would clash, and the Levites would sing accompanied by the Nebel and Kinner, which are identified with the harp and cathara. So in the first century, as the sacrifice is being offered, we have this going on. According to the ancient rabbis, the, the ancient rabbis, the reason musical instruments, they, the reason they could be played in the temple on the Sabbath without violating the Sabbath prohibition of work, the reason they could do that was because playing them was an essential part of temple service. That's why they could be played on the Sabbath. Because they were an essential part of the temple service. Work that was essential to the temple service, such as the lighting of fires, that was understood to be outside of the Sabbath prohibition of work. So it shows you the connection there. And what made the playing of instruments essential to the temple service and thus outside the Sabbath prohibition of work was their association with sacrifices. That's why they were essential. They were intimately connected to the offering of sacrifices. Here's what McKinnon says. He says, the evidence suggests strongly that to play a musical instrument was indeed a violation of the Sabbath. In other words, it was work. That was prohibited. The central passage is a long discussion in the tractate sukkah of whether or not the halil, which is a flute, might be played in the temple on the Sabbath, whether that instrument could be played in the temple on the Sabbath. The basic premise to the question is that work which is essential to the temple service, the lighting of fires, to take an obvious example, overrides the Sabbath prohibition. If it's essential to the temple service, then it overrides the Sabbath prohibition against work. The playing of musical instruments in conjunction with the sacrifice is another legitimate example of such work, just like lighting of fires. They are so connected to the sacrifices that they're an example of that work. He says, and therefore, playing of the regular temple instruments, such as a cymbal and the nebel and the kinnor, is not questioned... Only the Halil, which, as we've seen, was added on 12 special occasions each year. The conclusion is that the Halil, when played in conjunction with the sacrifice, is essential and does override the Sabbath.
But when played at the water drawing during the festival of Sukkah, which is the festival of booths, he says is a mere expression of rejoicing and does not override the Sabbath. So what I want you to see is that that which is essential to the, to the temple service overrides the probe and it shows you that these things are essential. They're being used all the time, but on the Sabbath, the question, can they be used on the Sabbath? And the answer is yes, they can. Why? Because they're essential to the temple service. Why are they essential to the temple service? They're essential to the temple service because of their connection and association with the sacrifices. So I want you to see there is a connection here. And the close association of instruments with the Jewish sacrifices, you see that it's evident in early Christian writings. John Chrysostom, the 4th century Christian theologian, in his work on homilies and the epistle to, on the epistle to the Hebrews, he says that Christians are to bring to God the kind of sacrifices that can be offered on the heavenly altar. He says not sacrifices of sheep and oxen or blood and fat. And then referring to John chapter 4 verse 24, he says that Christian offerings are those that are made through the soul or spirit, we could say heart, or inner man. See, those things, those are sacrifices, Christian offerings are those that are made through the soul or spirit, see, which he contrasts, those kinds of sacrifices, he contrasts with the Jewish temple offerings by saying things which have no need of a body, no need of instruments, nor special places. See, the Jewish sacrifices, according to Chrysostom, they had a need of a body, instruments, and special places. So what I'm, I'm suggesting to you is that even early Christian writers recognize the intimate association of instruments with the Jewish sacrificial system. He says that. Now, a number of modern scholars have commented on the close connection between instrumental music and the Jewish sacrificial system. Just so you know that, you know, what I'm saying to you, I always like to let you see that I'm not a nut. Okay? That this is not something that, well, you know, this is some kind of thing he picked up on the internet. Uh, here's what, uh, Eric Werner, who is a renowned, he's dead now, but a renowned, I've mentioned him before, Jewish historian of music. Eric Werner says, it is important to bear in mind that all music of the temple, regardless of the period, was nothing but an accessory to its sacrificial ritual. Without sacrifice, the music loses its raison d'etre, its reason for being. What was the inherent connection between the sacrifices and its accompanying music? This is an unsolved puzzle. Well, I'm going to mention a possible solution to that puzzle in a moment. But let me carry on here. Everett Ferguson. He says, instrumental music, therefore, was an important feature of temple worship, and it was closely associated with the sacrificial system. Edward Foley, who's a professor of liturgy and music, at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago in his book, Foundations of Christian Music. He says, the singing of religious texts appears to have followed the offering of sacrifices and trumpet blast often accompanied the sacrifices. Later rabbinic literature, as well as the writings of Josephus, further note the connection between instrumental music and sacrifice in the temple. So I want you to see this connection that is there. Now, as for Werner's unsolved puzzle, his question about the inherent connection between sacrifices and instrumental music, well, one possible answer to that was suggested decades ago by G.I. Williamson, who is a, a, a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, not the Churches of Christ. Orthodox Presbyterian Church, in his contribution to the book, uh, The Biblical Doctrine of Worship, he suggests this. He says, the whole system of ceremonial worship served as a shadow of heavenly things. Hebrews 8.5. It was a figure 
for the time then present, 9-9. But a figure of something better in the future, in plain words, here the drama of the redemption was enacted symbolically. We use the word drama because this Old Testament ceremonial worship was only a representation of the real redemption which was to be accomplished, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with the precious blood of Christ. That is why this impressive assembly, now this is just his speculation about why. What is the connection? He says, that is why this impressive assembly of musicians was needed. In a similar way, a motion picture is a pale thing in comparison with the reality depicted. That's why sound effects and a musical background are so important. It helps his Old Testament people as children under age, Galatians 4, sense something more in these animal sacrifices than was actually there. So as the sacrifice was offered, the emotions of God's people were stirred by this great cacophony of music. So his speculation about the connection is that these things are symbols and it's a way of investing them and helping them understand that they point to something deeper. Stirring them up because these things are just shadows. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know. But when the guy says, you know, this is an unsolved puzzle, well, just think about it a while. You see, and this is just one solution possibly to why, what is this connection that we see? Now, many theologians throughout history have recognized the significance of the new covenant's abrogation of temple worship. Okay, the fact it did away with temple worship, they have recognized the significance of that on the use of instrumental music in Christian worship. So this is, I'm saying, you're beyond the argument from silence, a covenantal view of a cappella worship. This is not anything new. Theologians have recognized this a long time. I earlier gave you a number of examples from the, earth, from the first centuries of the church. I won't repeat all of those, but I'll just give you Eusebius, and then I could also, I could, I could add to this, uh, Chrysostom and Nicaea and Theodoret and Isidore of Pelusium and no doubt others, but I just want to remind you back in the early centuries of the church, you have theologians who recognize that this passing and doing away with temple worship had an effect on instrumental worship. So here's Eusebius, he says, of old, at the time those of the circumcision were worshiping with symbols and types, it was not inappropriate. Back then, Symbols and types. Then it was not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the Psalterion and Cathara. We render our hymn a living Psalterion and a living Cathara with spiritual song. As I said, I could multiply that, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do, I want to just give you a few, uh, several quotes now from the Reformation forward. Okay, these are, those were in the early church. But I want to give you just a few from the Reformation forward that recognize the significance of the fact that Christ's coming did away with temple worship. What impact does that have on using musical instruments in Christian worship? John Calvin, who's a, you know, one of the leading figures of the Protestant Reformation. Calvin said, I have no doubt that playing upon symbols in the 16th century, not American Restoration Movement, not 19th century, not Alexander Campbell. Okay, says, I have no doubt that playing upon cymbals, touching the harp and the viol, and all that kind of music which is frequently mentioned in the Psalms was part of the education. That is to say, the puerile, the juvenile instruction of the law. I speak of the stated service of the temple. But when they frequent their sacred assemblies, Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The papists, by which he means Roman Catholics, therefore have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostle is far more pleasing to him. So I'm just saying to you, see, we get the idea in Churches of Christ, I think, that this is some kind of quirky oddity of 19th century American restaurant. And if I do nothing else in this class, I want you to understand that that's not true. 
Okay? John Gerardo was a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. And this is from his book. He's, he's in the 19th century. It's Calvin's 16th century. Now I'm up to the 19th century. Gerardo says, those who have urgently insisted upon Old Testament authorization for musical instruments in worship. Because people say, well, David used them. You see them all over. God appointed them. Blah, blah, right? So that's what he's talking about. He says, those who've urgently insisted upon Old Testament authorization for musical instruments of worship have acted with logical consistency in importing priests into the New Testament church. And as priests suppose sacrifices, lo, the sacrifice of the mass. Instrumental music may not seem to stand upon the same foot as that monstrous corruption, the mass, that there's this ongoing sacrifice. But the principle which underlies both is the same. And that, whether we are content with a single instrument, the cornet, the bass viol, the organ, or go on by natural development to the orchestral art, the cathedral pomps, and all the spectacular magnificence of Rome. We are Christians and we are untrue to Christ and to the spirit of grace when we resort to the abrogated and forbidden ritual of the Jewish temple. Okay, so I just want you to know, you see, this is not something quirky. Brian Schwertley is a modern day minister in the Presbyterian church and he writes in his book or in his article I think he says the glory of the temple with its visible display and audible grandeur no doubt stimulated the senses and inspired all but now that Christ has come and instituted the New Testament ordinances our focus is to be wholly upon him the reality the simple unadorned worship of the gospel era brings us into the presence of the greater temple, Jesus Christ, as we sing divine songs, hear the word of God, listen to the preaching, and feast spiritually upon Christ's body. Putting shadows, incense, musical instruments, vestments, altars, etc., into new covenant worship merely serves to hide Christ and his glory under obsolete externalities. Okay, so I want you to see that the... It is not quirky to recognize that Christ's effect in doing away with temple worship carried with it the abrogation of the instrumental music that was intimately associated with that sacrificial system. Okay, that's not an unusual thing to recognize and to a conclusion to draw. Well, now, if you're with me, you're thinking, okay, I see what you're saying here, but what about singing? They sang in the temple. They sang in the temple. They did indeed. Singing is continued in Christian worship, despite its association with temple worship, because it differs from playing musical instruments in spiritually significant ways. Specifically, singing like all speech. Singing like all speech is an internal immediate expression of the rational element of the inner man, an expression of the soul or heart or spirit, whereas instrumental music is an external, non-communicative sound made through an inanimate, a lifeless, Man-made object. So the former is ideally suited for the worship of God who is spirit, and the latter isn't. Now, there's no question that singing is part of Christian worship, right? I mean, you have New Testament texts that say that specifically. And then you have, when you look in the years after the New Testament, the early writers you have Pliny the Younger, the Pagan, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Clement of Alexander, Basil of Caesarea, John Chrysostom, and I'm sure many others. That you could go and recognize that singing not only is stated in the New Testament, but that practice is followed as a common part of Christian worship. So that's a fact. Right? That's, that's a data point. We know that singing is part of Christian worship. Singing is a spiritual sacrifice. So you're saying, well, I see that they didn't use instruments. They continued singing. These are in the temple. What's the difference? And I'm trying to articulate for you. What is it that allowed singing, despite having been used in the temple, to continue, but instruments not? Okay? So we know singing was commanded. We know it continued. This by God. 
And so what, what's the difference? And I'm focusing on that distinction. Now, that's, that singing is a spiritual sacrifice. That Christians, as a holy priesthood and a spiritual temple, they are to offer to God. You see, for example, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, and I've, I've just gone to 4, 4 and 5 and 9 here. But in verses 4 to 9, Peter says that their incorporation into the new temple through faith in Christ is with the purpose of there being a holy priesthood that offers to God spiritual sacrifices. See, meaning rather than the physical sacrifices of the Jewish priesthood under the old covenant. And these spiritual sacrifices, he says, they are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. No offering is acceptable to God. If it's made by one who hasn't been set apart as God's own through participation in Christ's atoning work. I mean, that's like ground zero. Nothing offered to God is acceptable, but through those who have been redeemed in Christ. But he says here that this, this nature of the spiritual sacrifices that he has in mind, he indicates that in verse 9 where he says, the purpose of there being a royal priesthood is to proclaim the praises of of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as J. Ramsey Michaels in his commentary on 1 Peter says, he's quoting D.L. Balch, he says, in context where ex angelo refers to proclaiming the praises, deeds, righteousness, or works of God, the proclaiming always is to God in worship. You see, so what is Peter saying? When he's talking about this, what's this idea when he, when he says in verse 9, the, the purpose, the nature of the spiritual sacrifices, it is to proclaim the praises, and here we see what this is. It is what we do as we gather together. He goes on and says, whatever else they may imply, the spiritual sacrifices are first of all the praise of God by his people. That is a, see, our spirits are vocalized. Our spirits, our inner person, our heart is given immediate expression. This is how we interact. And so it's just vocalized to God straight from the spirit. You see, praising God like that. Edmund Clowney in his commentary, he says, Peter says that we've been brought from darkness to light and made a priesthood so that we may show forth God's praises. This spiritual worship has no earthly altar or ark. It has transcended the elaborate ceremonials of Old Testament worship. It is vain to imitate in pageantry the ceremonies that ended when the veil of the temple was torn in two. Yet worship remains the central calling, not only of the Christian, but of the Christian church. And I just think that's important to pause on. Because sometimes we look at this and have a sense that this is perfunctory. That we just gather, we just come here, okay, I was at church today. That's not how it is. You see, we assemble and we are a spiritual temple and we are as a community of redeemed people expressing our spirits to God. Amen. You see, that's why singing is important. This is, what, this is what's going on. All right, he, he says, uh, it finds its burning focus in lifting the name of God in adoration. This function of the priesthood cannot be delegated. God's praises must rise from the lips of all his people assembled before his face and joining with the festival assembly of the saints and angels. So I always like that idea. When we gather together, there's something happening. Amen. You know, this is, this is big doings. You know, like in, in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about these angels. It's like they're observing here. They're they're watching, they're, they're participating, or here seeing. And I just don't know that we always capture that in, in our sense as we're here, that something is happening. This is, this is amazing what's going on. And we ought to be thrilled to be a part of it. Amen. You see, so that's, that's uh, anyway, that's Edmund Clowney's comment on that text. Now, this is similar in Hebrews 13, 15. He says, through him then... Let us always offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips praising his name. William Lane, in his commentary on Hebrews, he says, if the clicker will work, 
The writer of Hebrews draws upon a tradition of a song of praise which the community offers to God. You see, our spiritual worship, what is this? Our spiritual sacrifice, what is it? It is this fruit of lips praising God, singing. David De Silva, in his commentary, he says, this text, Hebrews 13, 15, identifies the fruit of our lips as the appropriate tribute to give back to God for the good things God sends. Within the setting of the community addressed by the author of Hebrews, this response would no doubt include the offering of praise and worship in the setting of the Christian assembly. And so that's what we do. We are coming here and we are offering spiritual sacrifices. You see, praise going up to God from our spirits. Now, early Christian writers understood that singing is a spiritual sacrifice that Christians are to offer to God. For example, Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century, so about 150, Justin Martyr said, we've been instructed that only the following worship is worthy of him. And I shared this with you weeks ago. Not the consumption by fire of those things created by him for our nourishment. Not these physical bodily sacrifices, but the use of them by ourselves and by those in need. While in gratitude to him, we offer solemn prayers and hymns for his creation and for all things leading to good health. You see, so this idea of prayers and hymns are being offered up. Tertullian. Some 50 years after Justin Martyr, so around A.D. 200, he, he held up prayer. He holds up prayer in contrast to the fat of rams and the blood of bulls and goats. He holds the prayer up as a kind of sacrifice that qualifies as worship in spirit and truth. He says, Tertullian says, this victim, that's sacrificial talk. He's talking about prayer, but he characterizes it as a victim because that sacrifice. He says this victim, devoted from the whole heart, fed on the faith, tended by truth, entire in innocence, pure in chastity, garlanded with love. We ought to escort with the pomp of good works. This victim of prayer, this sacrifice that we're offering up, we escort it amid psalms and hymns unto God's altar. That's what we do as an assembly of people. Amen. We're doing this. So Tertullian recognized this. And I, I go back here again and I say these things to you so that you don't think, well, this is somehow novel. It's not novel. Not novel in the least. Now, recalling that new covenant worship is worship that is more suitable for offering to a spiritual being, it's noteworthy, at least to me, that words and spirit are associated in Scripture. You can see this, words are vocalizations of the Spirit. I mean, that seems obvious to me anyway. But I want you to see, for example, Job says, Who has helped you utter these words and whose spirit spoke from your mouth? That's what speech is. That's what vocaliz That's what utterances are. They are articulations sharing, so it now becomes communal, and we, we can hear it, it's communicating my spirit to you. If I don't speak, it stays here. The way I share that spirit with you is to vocalize. And so he says here about this, whose spirit's broke? Uh, 32, in, in Job 32, Elihu says, 32, 18 and 19, for I'm full of words. And the spirit within me compels me. Inside, I'm like bottled up wine, like new wineskins ready to burst. So do you see he's talking about speech is simply the spirit. Vocalizations, most important, John 6, 63. Jesus says the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. And they are life. You see, this is the thing about vocalizing things, this connection with the Spirit. And the same concept is present in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, and in Luke 6, 45. And you can also look at Matthew 5, 18, where Jesus says what? Out of the overflow of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, and the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament points out that the word spirit, panuma, the word spirit is used several times in the New Testament in the sense of the inward person or heart. See, so they can be synonyms, spirit and heart, inner person, soul. And so Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, out of the overflow of the inner person, out of the overflow of the soul, out of the overflow of the spirit, the mouth speaks. It is a vocalization of the spirit. In Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16, Paul refers to singing and making music with or in your heart to God or the Lord. And this shows the inner aspect of Christian singing. The fact it originates in the heart or in the spirit or in the inner man or the soul. And it's an expression of the entire person. That's why it's so fitting for worship of a God who is spirit. Musical instruments, on the other hand, Paul describes as lifeless. They are lifeless. They are inanimate, man-made. Non-communicative, mechanical devices. Chrysostom in the fourth century, he said in his homily on Psalm 146, he says, David at that time was singing in the Psalms and we today with David. He had a cathara of lifeless strings. The church has a cathara arranged of living strings. Our tongues are the strings of our cathara. Putting for a different sound, yet a godly harmony. For indeed, women and men, old and young, have different voices, but they do not differ in the word of hymnody, for the Spirit blends the voice of each and affects one melody in all. The soul is an excellent musician, an artist. The body is an instrument, holding the place of the cathara and alos and lyre. Since it is necessary to pray unceasingly, the instrument is always with the artist unceasingly. You see, this is, this is how we are with our very beings. John Mark Hicks, who's a professor of theology at Lipscomb University, he was an adjunct, he taught at Harding for a while, then he was an adjunct there, I don't know if he still is. Now, he, as far as I know, he's the only other person associated with the Churches of Christ that I've cited to you. Everett Ferguson, who's an internationally respected church historian, and now John Mark Hicks at Lipscomb University. He expresses the distinction this way in an article that he wrote. He says, a cappella music derives its emotional and spiritual vigor from the heart which sings rather than from the instrument which generates emotional response from external sources. This is the contrast between extrinsic and intrinsic generation of worship emotion. You see, we are singing and pouring out our spirits to God. I think Everett Ferguson captures the idea beautifully in his book on a cappella music. Ferguson says, vocal expressions are peculiarly well suited to the expression of spiritual worship, to the expressing of what comes from the human spirit and through the spirit of God. They are rational. Not in the sense of non-emotional, but as proceeding from and appealing to the highest of human nature. The whole self, including the emotions, is involved in Christian worship, but the mind, reason, is to be in control. Instrumental music can express feelings and emotions. Vocal music can express the will and intellect. The latter is better suited for the communion of spirit with spirit. In vocal music, there is an immediate contact. In instrumental music, there is an intermediary. The voice is much more a matter of one's self than any other gift of praise can be. Vocal music thus best corresponds to the nature of one's relationship with God. And I think that's beautifully said. And Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Baptist preacher, perhaps the most famous Baptist preacher of that time. 
He put the matter more colorfully. He said, what a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of a quartet, the refined niceties of a choir, or the blowing off of wind from inanimate bellows and pipes. We might as well pray by machinery as praise by it. Now that's Spurgeon. Karl Barth. Karl Barth was perhaps the most famous theologian of the 20th century. He's a Swiss theologian, long dead, but he was perhaps the most famous theologian of the 20th century. Karl Barth said, the Christian community sings. It is not a choral society. Its singing is not a concert, but from inner material necessity, it sings. Why does it sing? It sings because we are expressing our spirits to God. He says it sings. Singing, this is Bart, singing is the highest form of human expression. It is to such extreme expression that the vox humana, the human voice, is devoted in the ministry of the Christian community. It is for this that it is liberated in this ministry. It is hard to see any compelling reason why it should have to be accompanied in this by an organ or harmonium. Indeed. <laughs> you see, we gather together. We express ourselves. We are redeemed new covenant people who praise God in our spirits and we do it freely. Now singing also is distinctly suitable for worshiping God because it's Verbal communication. It is a form of speaking. As Paul indicates in Ephesians 5.19. The words of praise that are sung. These words are understandable. And thus they can build up the gathered saints. Right? Which this is what God desires. Worship is praise to God. But he says you are to do things in the assembly as you praise God. That your brothers and sisters might be blessed and built up. That's why he says speaking in tongues, you can't do it unless there's an interpreter because people don't, it's non-communicative. It doesn't have the ability to teach and instruct and build up, whereas when we praise, you can understand it. Well, musical instruments are that way, they're non-communicative. However beautiful they are, they have no content, you see. So I think it's suited that way. And also you could add to that that singing is ideally suited for expressing the priesthood of all believers, and that all members of the community can offer this spiritual sacrifice, whereas instrumental music can only be offered by musicians. And we do that. Now, I hear that bell. Let me tell you where I'm headed. You'll be glad to know that last week is it. I want to, next week, I'm going to talk about some of the things that people say, because uh, I know you're thinking, well, what about Revelation? What about this? I know what you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about some of those things. I'm going to run through some of those things about what do people say about these things. And uh, I want to lay that out to you. And if I have some time, I want to remind you of the relevance of Romans 14 and 15. I did that a couple months ago. Uh, so I'll just remind you. But that's where we're headed. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be finished with that. The next week after that, I'll be visiting the world's cutest grandchildren, Lord willing. And then we come back, we will at last begin our study of the Gospel of Mark. Thank you.